for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge has marked the upward surge of mankind. Of course, I don't believe that. The discerning quick minds among you will know that that's the famous speech by Michael Douglas's character, the corporate raider Gordon Gekko, in the 1987 film Wall Street. The truth is that Jeff Bezos makes Gekko look like a petty ante small-time crook. And the crooks who control government on behalf of big corporations are in the same Bezos League when it comes to the massive shift in wealth they engineer. And today, I'll be talking about those topics with my guests. This is Jonathan Tassini, and it's great to have you with us for our show for January 27th, 2021. Hey, did you miss me? We took a month break on the podcast team to take a deep breath and do a little clear thinking about 2021 because it's going to be a big year for all of us, and there's a lot to talk about. Part of this is how to connect and make financially viable what I do here in the podcast with the e-newsletter I've started to do over at Substack and also a second newsletter under development. In the near future, I just wanted to let folks know part of the content on Working Life will turn into premium content for paying subscribers. Paying meaning, of course, at a very modest rate to be sure, just to keep us going here. If you want to get a jump on that, you can lend a hand by going over to workinglife.org, look for the podcast tab and click over there. You will see a link to Patreon where you can sign up as a one-time sponsor or a monthly supporter. Or you could do the same thing by using Act Blue. Go over to Act Blue and look for Working Life with Jonathan Tassini. And there you also can become a one-time sponsor or a monthly sponsor. It's a new year, but I'm starting out with two guests who have been on the show before because they bring to this audience two things we care about a lot. How big money corrupts and controls our government and the obscene wealth of a few people that is fueling a historic level of inequality. Now, you may remember, you can go back and check this in our archive, that just before the election, Jeff Hauser, the executive director of the Revolving Door Project, came on the show to talk about how corporate interests would, as always, try to dominate and control a potential Biden administration if, of course, he won. That's not a shocker. The one enduring fact of any government in this country is the way in which the real powers corporate and private wealth push the levers behind the scenes. It's the revolving door between government and big money, a door through which all sorts of manipulators and greedy people pass through from government to corporations and then back to pro-corporate lobbying companies. You know that. That's no surprise. We all know that that's the reality. And usually the job is how much can us progressives and citizens try to limit that influence, which is made even tougher with the corrupt money that flows into elections to buy off politicians of both parties. So now that Biden is president, Jeff is back to give us an update how it's all played out so far. So Jeff, you are like a retailer, meaning you have a high season, a low season, retailers have Christmas, they have New Year's, they have Easter, whatever it is. Your high season is really every four years when there's a change in administration. If the administration, the one that exists, is not reelected, then you have a lot of change going on. And this is where the revolving door is spinning like crazy. And my audience is pretty sophisticated. But let's take a minute and describe and define what the revolving door is. Um, the revolving door is the movement in and out of government, but not out of government to like a normal job, be it a teacher, a plumber, a small business owner. It's into the business of selling political knowledge. And so what we are concerned uh, about at the revolving door project is the movement of people in and out of government, but not out of the nexus of government, but instead to places where they can privatize their understanding and connections within government. 
They're taking their knowledge built in the public sector and selling it to private uh, companies. It could be by going in-house and bringing that knowledge to Facebook. It could be going into a lobbying shop. It could be going to a big law firm and selling your knowledge of how antitrust enforcement does or does not work or tax enforcement or whatever. But the revolving door is people going into government from the influence sector or from a regu heavily regulated company or a company that should be regulated, like again, Facebook, um, and into government or vice versa, people leaving government and then going into the private sector and helping them avoid regulation. Now, what we care about, meaning you and I as progressives, is the movement from government into supporting and arming private companies like Facebook, you mentioned, with the kind of information that allows them essentially to screw the people. Because then this was often a definition that I wanted to make a distinction of in the past when I went to lobby on behalf of labor unions, on behalf of the people, that's very different if you're going to, for example, lobby to get higher social security benefits, if you're going to lobby to make sure that the safety and health of people is you know, high in workplaces. If you're a union member, a union leader who served in administration, then you go back to your union. We don't care about that. What we're concerned about is private power, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, in the 1970s, there was this unfortunate tendency among good government groups to equate labor union lobbyists and public citizens, public citizens lobbyists, which were the two largest left of center lobbying forces in the 1970s, uh, and corporate lobbyists, and basically say lobbying was the bad thing. Even though lobbying as a right is in fact guaranteed in the constitution and there's nothing wrong with trying to influence public policy. What is wrong is corporations acting like they are people. They're not even necessarily, the ownership of American, quasi American companies is often not even American. There's just no uh, constitutional or associational right for a for-profit entity to lobby. But basically the, uh, good people, the good women and men who have been lobbying on behalf of the public interest, which could be conservative, right? Like somebody who actually is genuinely has right-wing views has a right to organize amongst their fellow uh, Americans and let their uh, ideas be known. But that's, to my mind, much less troubling than corporate America buying influence. And so that is what Revolving Door Project is moving against. It's a different emphasis than the public interest and good government groups of the 1970s and 1980s would recognize. But I think it's more increasingly broadly recognized by good government groups that the real worry is corporate America's lobbying influence, not lobbying as an institution. And I want to make the parallel observation. I don't want to go down into this rabbit hole that this is very much connected to the question of campaign finance, that all of a sudden corporations have been ruled by the Supreme Court to be like people, that they can spend huge amounts of money to influence public policy. And, and that has been equated, erroneously in my view, and probably yours too, as if you or I are making our little contribution to a candidate. And so that's been given equal weight and allowed. And that's where the whole corruption really lies is the way in which, as you know, I'm just saying this to my audience, the way in which campaigns are financed, which then leads essentially to the revolving door. So when you and I checked in with each other a couple of months ago, this was before the election, and really we didn't know what was going to happen with this revolving door, although at least I had some concerns and suspicions because of Joe Biden's history. Uh, he's not, if I can be quite clear and obvious, he's not from the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. He came from a much more centrist, if I can use that term, uh, a much more aligned in many ways with corporate interests. He hails from Delaware, and so he was the front person on the bankruptcy bill, for example, that helped credit card companies to go after regular people. But there was some concern about that. So give me, first of all, an overview, sort of a picture from your point of view of what you found now in these appointments since the administration won the election. Uh, we have found that, in general, progressives are doing better now than 12 years ago, even if many times they're not doing spectacularly well. And the Biden team is in fact interested in unity. Uh, they are reaching out. And so even when there are some picks who leave some progressives uh, somewhere between concerned and angry, 
there's a lot of outreach after the fact. Like for instance, uh, labor was kind of split on the Department of Labor pick. Marty Walsh came out of the building trades, but he just today, uh, Julie Sue, who came out of the more informal worker, immigrant worker uh, protection world uh, out in California has done some great stuff. She just uh, decided to come on board as the number two at the Department of Labor, which she would not- Ah, you're breaking really, news here. That's great news. Uh, which she would not have done unless she had an insurance that I'm sure that she could make a difference. I and mean, she was the Labor Secretary in the state of California. She had a good job already. Um, Tom Vilsack, who we've been very worried about, um, he's exactly the same choice as 12 years ago, but he has been frantically trying to reach out to groups that represent African-Americans who live in rural parts of the country and or black farmers. He's been reaching out to people interested in anti-monopoly and uh, reigning in the power of big ag. So that's even on the like cases where there's been some real concern, there's been some uh, good news. Office of Management and Budget, I know a lot of Bernie S Sanders supporters have a lot of feelings about uh, the nominee, Mira Tandon, but like she's been filling up the rest of the Office of Management and Budget with some really terrific people. Sam Bagenstoff has huge connections to the labor movement and to uh, civil rights community. Sharon Block is gonna be running this obscure, but really important uh, office called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, which basically exists to decide what regulations happen or do not happen. And like she wants it to make regulations happen. 12 years ago, Barack Obama put Cass Sunstein in. Cass Sunstein was a dedicated enemy of American workers, the environment, and public safety. He was just a catastrophe. Um, you go down and down the list, like Tim Geithner versus Janet Yellen, that's a huge win. Uh, there are places in which it's not a clear win, but I don't think there's a single place in which Obama appointed somebody better than under Biden. And there are many places in which Biden's done better. And some of Biden's most disappointing picks those picks have been reaching out and trying to reach common ground with progressives. So I would say it's overall encouraging, but the thing that we need to watch out for is that basically, if you have some progressives vouching for somebody and they're mistaken, it can cause us real problems. So right now we're in the fight for about the control or the currency position, which sounds like it's about like printing $20 bills or something, but it's actually about regulating 70% of banks and deciding whether or not, I'm sorry, were you deciding whether or not like FinTech should get to write its own rules of the road going forward? And like they, there you have a candidate who's totally captured by FinTech, this guy, Michael Barr, but because he has a couple of people like uh, Sheila Bear and uh, Cordray from, uh, Rich Cordray from the CFPB under Obama, saying nice things about him. He's being presented as uh, palatable to progressives. So Okay, so like, let, let's kind of go back and, and chop this down a little bit uh, and try to use a, as few acronyms as possible. You mentioned Richard Cordray, who was from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, I live on the West Coast. I don't live inside the Beltway. I'm kind of teasing you a little bit. So one of the things on this show is we try to X out or limit the number right. of number of acronyms so my audience can kind of stay with it. Although, again, my audience is very sophisticated, thankfully. So let's start with the Department of Labor, because I agree with you that from my point of view, the DOL picks have been quite good at many levels. And I'm, I'm sure you'll agree, it's not just observing what's happening at the secretary level. It's who gets picked as the number two and even the assistant secretaries of the various departments, because those are the folks that often are doing the day-to-day -day job and have some way, in some way, day-to-day -day power. Marty Walsh will be the Secretary of Labor, but he kind of will give broad overviews, broad direction. You've got other people trying to implement stuff. But I do think, for example, the head of OSHA, who I know is a, for I, I've actually worked with him, former guy from the Steelworkers, uh, is a really terrific person. Um, Janelle Jones, who is gonna be the chief economist of the DOL, as you know, has come from, among others, uh, um, the uh, I think it was NELP, the uh, National Employment Law Project. So she comes from a progressive background. So you've got a whole list of folks. And I was glad that you pointed out that back in the Obama years, 12 years ago, that so many of his appointments were very much coming from the corporate world. Now, let's in fact dig into some of the problems because in some way, it's not about quantity. It's about where those people are squirreled away. And number one on my list was Bruce Reed, 
who is going to be the deputy chief of staff. And as you know, the chief of staff and his or her deputy, they have enormous power because they really decide where the trains are going to run. They decide what the priorities are, the staff picks, and also who occupies and gets the president's time. And you've got Bruce Reed, who was really, I, I consider to be one of the great enemies of the people. He was the guy who was the former director of the Bowles Simpson Commission. And again, because I want to live by my own credo, that was the so-called deficit reduction committee that Obama appointed. And Bowles and Simpson, it was supposed to be this bipartisan committee. Bowles was supposed to be the quote-unquote Democrat. And you had Alan Simpson, who was now the former senator of Wyoming. And their essential goal was to cut spending. And they went around promoting this insane idea that we had a deficit problem in this country, which would have meant cuts in Social Security, Medicare, and a whole range of things. Now, they needed a supermajority to get their recommendations implemented. And just one kind of interesting note, I know progressives have a lot of criticism of Nancy Pelosi, but I will always cut her some slack because it was really Nancy Pelosi who said, over my dead body will there be cuts in Social Security and Medicare back in the commission when that commission put forth its recommendations. And that was going against her own president, against Barack Obama. So my, my point is, Bruce Reed's ideology is about this deficit mania. And, and the reason I focus on him is we are at a moment, and I'm saying this to my audience, you know this well, Jeff, we're at a moment where we have to spend big. Even Janet Yellen, who's going to be the Treasury Secretary, saying we have to have massive spending to deal with the pandemic, the economic collapse. So I'm real concerned about Bruce Reed. Give me your take on that. I mean, I think Bruce, we pushed very hard on Bruce Reed. Bruce Reed was up for both uh, running the Office of Management and Budget um, and also the National Economic Council. Um, and so Deputy Chief of Staff is a step down relative to those jobs, but not a deep step down, because as you suggested, just being in that mix, he has an office just a few doors down from President Biden. Uh, Bruce Reed definitely has influence, and that's definitely concerning. He also was one of the leads uh, against um, cutting, ending welfare as we know it, cutting aid to families with dependent children. A lot of racialized politics from the Clinton era had Bruce Reed's stamp on it. And so, yeah, his, his status is worrisome. Um, but if you look at the Council of Economic Advisors, you look at the National Economic Council below Brian Deese, and you look at what promises Brian Deese has made, even if we were a little skeptical of them, uh, National Economic Council and Council of Economic Advisors will likely in conjunction with Treasury Secretary Yellen, have the dominant influence on fiscal policy. And so I'm less worried that Reed's austerity-driven vision will dominate, um, though it's definitely worth keeping tabs on. I think it, his instincts towards um, splitting the baby, towards fetishizing bipartisanship could definitely exacerbate the worst tendencies that Joe Biden himself has. And so I think like Bruce Reed is definitely a problem, but I'm not worried that he is like, the secret dominant force in the West Wing. Mm. And by the way, I'm smiling because I find myself uh, amused by my uh, advocacy of Janet Yellen as the great um, holder of the line on behalf of big spending as a former uh, chair of the Federal Reserve Board. Although when she was the head of the Fed back then, she did pretty decent things. She was no Alan Greenspan, as your colleague Dean Baker pointed out many times on this program. Janet Yellen actually... Um, took a very, um, if I can say, expansive and s smart approach in terms of how she saw the challenge and really making sure that we they weren't trying to have any austerity. The Federal Reserve Board wasn't trying to basically um, cut down inflation or go after inflation. There was no inflation, but they basically opened up the spigot, for lack of a better term. So I think Janet Yellen is probably a positive force in how those things are going to play out. So let's go to your thing that you mentioned before, the fight over the control of the currency, which in fact, as you point out, people think, what the hell is that? Like, is that person just running the printing press? But in fact, they have huge uh, influence over 1,200 banks with total assets. I'm reading from actually something you put out, $14 trillion, which is about two thirds of the total US banking system. So that's an enormously powerful uh, position. And this guy, Barr, comes from 
the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, which is a fintech, and fintech stands for financial technology, right? Am I right? Yes. Funded group. And so explain, first of all, who that sector is and why bar is quite a danger to the people. So Comptroller of the Currency, as you said, is the key banking regulator. Or the, um, there are several banking regulators, but in many ways, the Comptroller of the Currency is the most important. Uh, Michael Barr uh, sidelined as the Dean of the Public Policy School at the University of Michigan, making more than $400,000 a year, but that's not enough for him. And so he does all sorts of um, consulting for the fintech industry, I guess on the side, I mean, who knows what is his actual dominant use of his time. He is an alum of the Geithner Treasury Department under Barack Obama. He was oh um, essentially, Tim Geithner is heavy on the Hill in the negotiating of Dodd-Frank. The administration was in this weird posture where they were constantly to the right of where the US Senate ended up, even with, with the filibuster at play. Uh, so Michael Barr has a lot of enemies on the Hill. Unfortunately, a lot of them uh, have current jobs that do not permit them to speak candidly about it. Um, so they just like blow up my signal with attacks on Michael Barr that I can't really quite get into the press, unfortunately. But then uh, FinTech is basically, it's almost like what it says. If like Wall Street and big tech had a kid, it would be FinTech. And so, so it's face, it's like as if Facebook married Citibank. Yeah. And this is their spawn. And this is their spawn. So they, they don't like your privacy. They don't like regulations. They are designed to have fewer regulations than a bank and to use the shininess of being tech to justify avoiding the regulations that we've built out on banks. The control of the currency under uh, Trump was aggressively seeking to charter fintech entities to do some of the work of banks without the responsibilities and regulations of banks. And I, we fear that Michael Barr might continue that and a whole other swath of how do we deal with fintech questions which the comptroller of the currency is both going to be point on for many reasons, and will also the comptroller of the currency sits on the board of the FDIC, which is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. You know, you see it on all your cash money, like in short, uh, and like your bank deposits, unless you have more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, are insured by the FDIC. So the comptroller of the currency is one of five members on that board. They're one of the nine permanent members of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which monitors trends in the economy to figure out what is and is not scary. So this person has enormous power over the two thirds of the banks that they directly regulate and just the, the making of financial regulatory policy generally. And if FinTech so, gets their guy in, they are going to do very well, I suspect. And what does that mean for the average consumers? That mean that banks would then be able to redline more. They would be able to engage in the kind of um, dangerous behavior that led to the collapse in 2009 with mortgages. What's the practical effect of what banks are looking for? What and the actually not just banks, but the tech industry, Facebook, Citibank. What are they looking for for Bar to do for them? I mean, they are specifically. Part of this is entities, including up to possibly Facebook, which introduced a, or is tried to introduce a currency Libra, which is now called the M. Uh, they they want to issue currencies. There is crypto that wants to um, claim to be a currency, but then claim that the, it's going to uh, appreciate in value, like everyone, like all these Bitcoin enthusiasts people may have encountered on Facebook or on Twitter. Um, they. There are all these entities that want to become the replacement for payment services. Um, they want to take over the bank's role, bank's role in like moving money around, and they want to do so with fewer regulations. We have a culture that is at times been destabilized, but was created under FDR of rules to try to make banking boring again. The Dodd Frank Act in 2010 uh, under Obama was an effort to make banking at least somewhat more bo boring, less profitable, but also less prone to inducing bubbles and to victimizing customers. If you think that like subprime mortgages were fi a great financial innovation, you're going to love what fintech has in mind for the American consumer. Hmm. All right. I want to touch on two other people, and then I want to ask you a wrap up question. One person that has not gotten a lot of attention, but to me is quite dangerous, is Gina Raimondo, who was the 
governor of Rhode Island. Was she governor or the treasurer? She was uh, governor, treasurer right? First, then governor. Then governor, right. And she has been nominated to be Commerce Secretary. Now, Commerce, you know, it, it's got a great name, Commerce, and it get, you get the sense, okay, it's going to control the economy. But in some way, it often has been a stepchild, if I can use that term, to the National Economic Council, to Treasury Secretary, to other more powerful players in cabinets of the past. I'm wondering what you think about her appointment and how influential she'll be. And the reason I bring her up is as a union member, I remember how she went after public employee pensions. And I consider to her to be almost like a sleeper agent inside that administration in terms of being against public employee unions, someone who's a danger, in fact, probably to even Social Security and someone who has a very, very right wing point of view on economics. Uh, absolutely. She um, made her name as a treasurer who was attacking uh, public employee pensions in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, she also invested a lot of Rhode Island employee, uh, pension money in her old venture capital firm, which was like an enormous conflict of interest, uh, but also a lot of uh, poorly performing hedge funds run by right wing, uh, egomaniacal, crazy people like Paul Singer and Dan Loeb. Um, and she has remained kind of hedge fund and private equity's favorite Democrat. Uh, she's also one of Michael Bloomberg's favorite Democrats. She was a co-chair of Michael Bloomberg's presidential campaign. Um, so the Commerce Department, uh, where does like private equity come in? Well, the Commerce Department is in large part in charge of intellectual property law. The Patent Bureau is within the Commerce Department. And if you are a Martin Shkreli type figure who likes to figure out a way to get pharmaceutical patents and use their monopoly power to drive up price and uh, make enrich yourself at the you know expense of some people dying because they can't pay for life saving drugs. Like Gina Raimondo is encouraging. Uh, the Commerce Department's also key on trade issues. Um, you were, you were telepathic. I was thinking about trade, even though Biden's appointment, and this is based on my friend Lori Wallach, the director of Global Trade Watch. She thinks that the appointment for the trade representative is quite good. Someone like Gina Raimondo in commerce and other departments, but she could be very dangerous to pushing forward a better trade uh, regime. Yeah, there's a, some specific powers. Trade power in the country is kind of splintered. Uh, the U.S. trade representative is the single most important person and Catherine Tai, um, I've heard it the same from Lori Wallach and others. Um, it seems like an amazing pick and we were very complimentary and that's a huge teaching from Barack Obama. Um, but Catherine Tai is not like the czar of all things trade. The Treasury Department, the State Department and the Commerce Department all have specific powers. And I'm, not, I'm worried that the powers that exist within commerce may not be wielded properly by uh, Gina Raimondo. And the last person I want to ask you about, we'll do this in, in short, is Steve Reschetti, who, as you point out, has spent his entire career shuffling through the revolving door, lobbying on behalf of corporate interests. Now, he's gotten the title of White House Counselor. Now, that can be a very nebulous kind of position. But where I'm concerned about is that position has enormous influences on the judicial nominations, and in the past, at least. And Obviously, one of the things that progressives want to do in the same way the right wing did through Mitch McConnell very effectively is push a slate of judges that are going to be progressive, that will rewrite the balance, which is now very heavily towards right wing and corporate interest. And if if you've got someone like Rischietti, who's a corporate person, he's going to push for the so-called moderate kind of judicial appointments and especially on corporate and, and economic rights. I mean, I care about social issues, don't get me wrong, but to me, one of the things that we often mistake and or miss is that the Supreme Court rules a lot on corporate issues and corporate rights, which hurt individuals and workers. What's your view of that? So I absolutely agree that the courts are critical. Um, the slightly weird DC thing is counselor and White House counsel are totally distinct jobs. And he is not the White House counsel. He is a counselor. And that essentially is a high level advisor. And he is going to be working along with Cedric Richmond at the Office of uh, Public Engagement. And I think Rashetti's job and Richmond's job is basically to talk to 
center-right forces as well as corporate America and take their input. And so he could do all sorts of nasty business in trying to elevate concerns and get them to the president's desk. So don't get me wrong, we, we remain very concerned about Reschetti. The White House counsel um, is Dana Remus, who worked um, with um, President Obama. Incongruously, she was an Alito quirk, but by all accounts, I think she's a Democrat and that's just uh, an unusual, it used to happen more often that you uh, ideologies of justices did not predict their clerks. By she the was under she work, she was under she was undercover when she worked for Alito. She probably well, had to keep Scalia her mouth shut to, a lot. <laughs> Scalia used to intentionally have a single house liberal who could oftentimes be quite liberal as just like an in-house devil's advocate. Yeah, uh, uh -huh. got rid of it by the time Remus was at the court and she was with Alito. It's a little weird, but. I think overall, there are a lot of people who are very movement connected in the White House Counsel's Office. And there have also been more groups who are pushing a harder edged agenda for Biden, including demand justice, take back the courts. The line for justice is coming out with a better agenda that wants, is really pushing Biden to choose judges from amongst public interest lawyers, labor union lawyers, plaintiffs lawyers who, so, I, I am mildly encouraged, but they need to just move fast, hard, and be willing to break norms. So let's end last question with a thematic observation and get your take on this. One of the reasons we have to be vigilant, in my opinion, and why your work is so important, not just in the first few months, but really throughout this administration, is the following. You know, Joe Biden has been around Washington for 30, 40 years. 40 years, his ideology is pretty set. And as I said in the beginning of the show, he had, he's no left winger. He's no Bernie Sanders, obviously. And, and so the question I wonder, how much of the progressive appointments the people have been able to get, especially into the economic positions, is really about the moment we're in, meaning the economic crisis, the pandemic, and that once we get through that, which we will at some point, certainly the pandemic, hopefully this year, the economic recovery is going to take longer. How much of what Biden is doing and the people he's putting in place at the National Economic Council, some of the economists, the people around him, like Jared Bernstein and others, is really about the moment to deal with the crisis. But we should never kind of rest and go to sleep on this because ultimately he might basically fall back on what his his intentions are and what his gut feelings are that are, again, built over 30 or 40 years. I mean, I think that Biden is less of an ideological figure and more of a traditional Paul who kind of puts his finger in the wind and senses where history and the party are going and uh, like finds himself comfortably in the middle. And I think the good thing for progressives is that we have convinced Biden that the country is moving in a leftward, more economically populist direction. And I think this is, he is gonna be the most immediately legacy minded uh, president ever because he's the oldest. And I, unfortunately due to tragedy after tragedy, this is a man who is under no misconception about um, mortality. And so I think he is looking to build a legacy on many fronts and I think we have convinced him and many in the center of the party that their legacy will look better if it nudges noticeably to the left of where the Obama administration was. And even the Obama second term was definitely more progressive in inclination than the first term, even as they had less legislative power. Um, and so I think there is a, in the long run, the center of the Democratic Party is getting it to a significant extent, look at like the $15 minimum wage and the views on deficit spending. I, I do think we're shifting, whether or not we're shifting as fast as the crises that we face demand, that is a, people can take a more, draw a more negative conclusion and I, it would be hard to completely argue. But I do think that we, and we, I, we also absolutely need to keep the pressure on because it's not like corporate America is gonna take, well, these first six months went badly. I guess we can't influence these people. They are going to be working for four years to try to influence uh, the people in the Biden administration and the turnover that will inevitably occur. Um, and they, they're going to stay on top of it and we're going to need to stay on top of them. 
both for their legislative agenda, but also the executive branch. Will the executive branch carry out the manifold powers it has to implement longstanding law, be it antitrust law, civil rights law, clean water? Like, if we want those laws uh, enforced, we're going to have to keep on pressing the executive branch in a way progressives have really never done before. Well, that's a great wrap up. And Jeff, thank you for your hard work. Thank you for being in the show. We're going to have you back, obviously, as this thing develops. And certainly if there's some uh, incredibly disastrous or maybe even I should be optimistic, something great that happens, you always have a place in the show to talk about this. Thanks for being here. Uh, My pleasure. Take care, Jonathan. I reach a point, as I think everyone does, when I just sit back in amazement and fury at the amorality and greed of people like Jeff Bezos. Look, I'm not naive. I see quite clearly the deeply immoral and corrupt economic system that has robbed millions of people across the globe. But I don't want to ever get so used to it that it just becomes the background noise or something I shrug about it. None of us should. During this entire pandemic, which is now approaching a full year of horror and destitution for so many, I've pointed out that the virus has just exposed the sickness that we've lived with for decades. A sickness where a handful of people become filthy rich at the expense of everyone else. You can see that in the poverty level minimum wage, which means that people labor like slaves to make the likes of the Waltons of Walmart billions of dollars in profits. Or the lack of paid sick leave, which is a main reason so many people have gotten sick in the job and then died because they could not afford to stay home from work when they got sick. This is a global sickness. It's in a way an immoral economic pandemic that the coronavirus has just shown a very bright light on. Now, each year, Oxfam comes out with an annual report on global inequality that is tied for the annual Davos conference. You know, the place where the rich, the elites fly in on their private planes to perform for each other and lord themselves over the rest of the planet, sprinkle with a few words or panels about social responsibility. Hey, you know, I have a solution. Just cancel Davos and just turn over your trillions in wealth to the people. Anyway, Each year, at least, I have the pleasure to talk about this gross reality of inequality with a great person, Paul O'Brien, who is the vice president for policy and advocacy at Oxfam America. And we're lucky to have Paul here today. So, Paul, we have now done this conversation about global inequality based on the incredible reports that Oxfam turns out each year. We've done this three years in a row. And... I want to start actually with this macro view, and I want to read from your report a really important little snippet and let you then react to that. And I'm going to read from this. And I have your report is so important that I have stuff spread all over my desk, and I realize that I need a much bigger desk when I'm doing Oxfam reports because I kind of want to read from everything. But here's an important point that I think you all made that the virus hit an already profoundly unequal world. And it's things that you and I have talked about. And what you write here is, and I'm quoting now, a world where a tiny group of over 2,000 billionaires had more wealth than they could spend in a 1,000 lifetimes, a world where nearly half of humanity was forced to scrape by in less than $5.50 a day, a world where for 40 years the richest 1% have earned more than double the income of the bottom half of the global population, a world where the richest 1% have consumed twice as much carbon as the bottom 50% for the last quarter of a century driving climate destruction. And the point you really make here, which is really, really stupendous, is that while we're going to talk mostly about the way in which the virus has exacerbated, the pandemic has exacerbated inequality, it has done that based on inequality that has kind of grown for generations, right? Yeah, it, you're totally right, Jonathan. It's a sad truth. Uh, we started doing these reports in 2014, January. So this is the eighth one. We timed it for when the, the, the rich and famous gathered in Davos in their fur coats and their planes jetting in to talk about carbon emissions and other great things. And, uh, 
And ever since we started, it's gotten worse. Uh, when, when, when the, you know, early 2007, 2008, at the last crisis, there were about 750 uh, billionaires in the world. And as you just said, now we've got 2,200 or more, and uh, they are just doing so well. The big fact in the report is that the richest 10 people made enough money during the pandemic to vaccinate everyone on the planet Earth if we had the actual vaccines, to pay for it all. So you imagine this. I mean, they could be sitting around a dinner table and think like, well, now, let's obviously not diminish our wealth. Let's just take the excess profits we made during the pandemic. What will we do with that? I've got an idea. How about we end the pandemic everywhere on the planet Earth for everyone? That's a great idea. Can we afford it? Oh, yes. And we'll still be as rich as we were. It's ludicrous. Now, you know, wonderful, wouldn't it be if that dinner party actually happened? But th the problem is, is it shouldn't be about that dinner party. It shouldn't be a voluntary or philanthropic exercise for these guys to decide what to do with their leftover money. So, yeah, it's been a great year for the richest. It's been a really good time for those who are super rich. Top 1,000 basically made all their money back in the first nine months. Um, but it has been terrible, catastrophic for uh, those on the wrong end of inequality. The last time we did this report a year ago, one of the things we said was, look, if there is a crisis, people who are living on $5.50 a day are in deep trouble because they may lose their job that was at least giving them one meal a day. Um, and we didn't even imagine at that point, at January, even though we might have, that the crisis that would come would actually make it dangerous for them to keep working, to go out into the workplace as an essential worker or as a care worker. We didn't imagine that they would all, if particularly if they lived in large urban slums, be in lockdowns and be prevented from moving, except if they were considered essential and could put themselves in harm's way. We didn't imagine that just sitting around in their home, unemployed, because two billion people went into the informal economy, would be a threat to their lives because they can't do social distancing if there's no PPE and there's no, dis there's no distance. When you've got a million people living in a square mile in Kibera or many of the other slums in South Asia, uh, Africa, or Latin America, Mexico, I'm thinking of, um, it's just, it, this pandemic landed in completely different ways for people. Some did really well and others hurt. That's a really good point about the question of social distancing and the way in which inequality has affected people. And I was laying in bed last night reading your report. This is what you do to me, Paul, in terms of my, my, my social life. Is <laughs> sorry. I, I lay in bed, I read your report, I think about it. And I did a, just a quick mental calculation. What would happen if Jeff Bezos, who I really detest, I think he is the example of amorality um, on steroids, if he took those excess profits that he made, which were huge, billions of dollars, and he simply said, I am going to rent hotel rooms on my dime for the rest of the pandemic to allow those people who are living, and I'm going to take the U.S. example, are living in very close quarters. And we know this is affecting people of color especially, and this is why you see the pandemic especially hitting people of color in the United States, because they live in communities where they often share small spaces. You have six, eight, ten people living in a one-bedroom apartment, which in some respects is much better, as you quite well know, than lots of people in the third world. He could actually make a difference in terms of saving people's lives just by doing that and still have more wealth than he could spend for a hundred lifetimes. Yes, that's actually lovely. Um, not lovely. It's terrifying, but it's a way to understand it's so hard to get our heads around the scale of their wealth, right? Just putting it into context. We, I'll, get, I'll tell you a funny story, actually. As we were developing the analysis of the report in late September, we calculated that if he handed a check of $105,000 to every one of his employees, and that was at the time 875,000 people, if he just went up to each one of those almost a million people and handed them a check for more than most of us earn in a year, he'd still have more money than he started the pandemic with. But the struggle with using that fact was 
by the time the report came out, just eight weeks later, he'd hired another almost 400,000 people to run his shop. So Anne was making more money. And now is, you know, in this battle with your man who does Tesla um, over like, can, can one of them be the first trillionaire? So we, one of the things, we literally have people who sit around to say, how do we explain to folks how much a hundred billion dollars actually is so that we can grasp how clearly a symptom of a broken economic model this is? We don't, we're not, we're not, you know, people who believe you, you shouldn't be able to work hard and earn money and some people are going to earn more than others. We're not against talent or hard work or functioning regulated markets where workers are protected and entrepreneurship is rewarded. What we're opposing is the scale of opportunism and basically power that comes along with that amount of money that makes it impossible for a lot of people to get ahead while these folks have are able to literally change the fate of nations, of peoples, of currencies, of whole societies and economies. It just isn't healthy. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because I might have a slight disagreement with you about that ideological positioning. It might be slight, but I, I do want to okay. say one more thing about Elon Musk and yeah. Bezos yeah. and those yeah. others. Those folks who increased their wealth, they increased their wealth partly because of the pandemic, because of the crisis, because people were forced to stay home. They were sick or there were a lockdown. So all of a sudden, Amazon became this service that people really needed because people were sitting at home and doing a lot of online shopping. And you look at those folks who especially made money, they actually exploited the pandemic to make even more money on the backs of people who were under siege. Yeah. It's, the, you know, whether it's uh, sort of an intent to use it or just the way that our economy is structured now, if you're ahead, if you're able to sit behind a desk as I am and earn money without doing anything more than sit being on a screen or doing research or engaging with others in, in the white collar economy, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm fine. But um, if, uh, as long as I have a job, I'm fine. Um, but if you're out there as an essential worker or a health worker, disproportionately women, disproportionately people of color, um, you are not fine in this pandemic. It has landed precisely as it's been so great for the richest amongst us. It's been terrifying for those who started off in a disadvantaged position. If, if we had the same number of Latinx and black people facing mortality rates as white people have in this country, we would have 22,000 people alive today who are not with us. Hmm. Uh, because this has landed in the United States in, in disproportionately harmful ways for communities that were already facing structural racism, structural economic uh, marginalization, and, uh, and forced to be out there on the front lines of the crisis, taking the most risks. And let's put a fine point on that really excellent point. Um, we've done a segment after segment on this show going back to when the pandemic started with frontline workers, healthcare workers, the people who are retail workers who are in grocery stores, poultry workers. Uh, Oxfam has done really important work on the crisis for poultry workers even before the pandemic. And that's the important point again that these billionaires – these corporations have been making money on the sickness and dying of many workers because they couldn't be bothered to spend money to make sure that workplaces were safe. Or if you weren't feeling well and you were ill, you had enough money to go home and get well and then come back to work. That certainly happened in the, in the United States. And I'm sure, and help us a little bit with this, that's the picture all around the world, even more so in places where, my God, you think about places like India and other places, third world countries where people crowd onto transportation uh, uh, vehicles where they can't socially distance because they had no choice. They had to go to work because otherwise they would starve. That's right. So start with the United States. Uh, you mentioned poultry workers. We are very fortunate to be able to accompany uh, poultry workers and the organizations that support them on fighting uh, against structural inequality. Uh, so it's this has been a path we've been on as you've covered in the years past. One story that came to us during the pandemic, somebody we've been working with, John Baptiste, um, 
he's a poultry worker, 44 years old, father of three, and uh, started to feel sick on the line, uh, on the manufacturing line, told his employers. They said, get back to work. Temperature started to go up, told them, keep working, got to a temperature above 40. Uh, and they said, go home. We can't help you go home. We don't want you affecting anyone else now that we believe you're genuinely sick. Um, his widow, because he passed a few days later, his widow went to the media and said he told them, they gave him no protection, and then they told him to go home. And now he's no longer with us, and I couldn't be with him during his last days because it was COVID. And the poultry factory sent him a hundred dollar check and said, Thanks very much, we're done. So it's not just the zillionaires um, who have done very well. We have a, a, an economic system which so rewards unprotected work and those who are able to instrumentalize workers that uh, if you are in charge of resources in that way, unable to run factories and, and, and there, there is almost no sanction for that kind of behavior which is why even in the United States, we cannot take this moment and just revert back to what we called normal because it was profoundly abnormal that that was allowed to happen. But I didn't want to dodge your question, Jonathan. I'm happy to talk because our, you know, Oxfam's privilege is not just to work in the United States. We are working alongside communities all around the world. And you're, you're absolutely right. As It's not that it's you know, tougher, but in economic terms, poverty is greater for sure. There are things that, folks don't have in the places where we work. A couple of examples. Uh, Latin America, 30% of kids have no access to the internet or to any kind of virtual education. They cannot do homeschooling. So when the pandemic hits lockdown, they're just sitting around wondering when life begins again. India, where you mentioned, uh, you have now, you've got a very tough lockdown going on you have exactly what you mentioned, people unable to work in uh, urban settings where social distancing is absolutely impossible. And you've got a pretty tough, and that's a euphemism, uh, regime that has refused even to, to, to look after the most vulnerable in its own population. So they're starting to manufacture vaccines, but they've made pretty clear that Dalits, and that's 200 million people on the lower end of what they call the caste system, uh, I shouldn't even use that word, um, are not going to get vaccines, are not going to get protected. And they're refusing, even though they are the one big production system in a democracy in the South that could help us get vaccines out to Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, they're refusing to export them because they want to make sure that their own uh, more elites in, in India get taken care of. So um, all around the world, we're seeing rates, nine out of 10 people having no access to a vaccine, not able to get back to work, dealing with the economic consequences of that, while uh, northern economies are increasingly awash in vaccines. And frankly, we're all really worried about whether we're going to get them quickly enough. But it's not even close to a possibility that you're going to see vaccines in most poor countries in this year, 2021. And what's bizarre about that, or stupid, <laughs> It, even from a capitalist standpoint, yeah. is if folks aren't vaccinated around the world and you don't give it to people for free and you don't use your wealth that you've accumulated, again, that you could not spend in a thousand years, then economies are going to be shut down. They're going to remain on lockdown. And that then affects your bottom line if you're a capitalist. So it's also just foolish from your own self-interest standpoint to be so greedy. Yep. Yeah. We, um, I remember we talked about this when we talked about the China case and we saw just two days ago, you know, their growth numbers are skyrocketing. They're having a better year in 2020 than they had in 2019 growth wise. And it's in part because there is no coronavirus there slowing things down. Now, we know they have an export market. They're very worried about precisely what you've said because they want economies back up and functioning and buying Chinese products again. So they are doing vaccine diplomacy. And make no mistake, that is the number one currency in 2021 in terms of determining who will have power and who won't. And meanwhile, we're letting a tiny number of US corporate in interests dictate the price of vaccines, the distribution levels, uh, and there are even manufacturing ones which are largely going to be irrelevant in the global south. So your point is exactly right, but we are 
missing the point uh, in the United States in terms of demonstrating that we understand vaccines everywhere is the only way to get rid of this pandemic. There's something to be said for having author authoritarianism, right, in China, where they basically say, this is what everybody's going to do or else. I'm, I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but yeah. it is true that uh, in a country where essentially people in this case are told what to do and people have to act in unison, which you would hope would be done in a democratic society like the United States, then you can actually address the coronavirus. You can get the pandemic under control. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm know, not for you... that. Let's be clear. Sure. I know you're not for that, obviously, because there are huge downside, the oppression of the Uyghurs, for example, exactly. in the Western exactly. part of China and so on. So I don't want to I want to be clear to my audience. I'm not holding up China as the model that we should use in this. But, case. Let, but, but let me rip off that for a sec, Jonathan, because. Yeah, I, I think you and I are in the same place. Um, I'm, I come out of it as a human rights activist, both on the economic and social rights side and the civil and political side. And I'm never going to be someone who says the Chinese model of approaching human rights is the way forward for countries everywhere. But if you have an authoritarian state which is able to oppress its own population or parts of it on the one hand and seemingly doing very well economically in terms of growth. You watch that The Economist is all this week about how wonderfully China is doing in terms of its own confidence, massive numbers of youth, really patriotic and actually quite progressive. They're offering a cultural uh, vision for the world now. It's not just the old, the old China. And if that is all based, you've got all this patriotism towards an authoritarian model. And what we are offering is more of a rights-based model where people are free, where democracy and economics are supposed to work together to give everybody economic opportunity and the right to vote for the, the system you want. We have a deep threat on our hands because it would be naive to assume that people in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Brazil or Chile or elsewhere aren't looking at the Chinese model and saying, hmm, you know, these northern countries in the United States has been offering us democracy and economics, but what I see over there is a very nice offer from China. And yeah, it's a little dodgy on political and civil rights, and they seem to be doing some things that are a little distasteful to some of their own folks, but, you know, we've got to get ourselves out of this economic quandary. And that is a deeply frightening thing for a, for a rights activist. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to do a little U.S. focus for a second, yeah. because the the outrageous wealth that these billionaires have accumulated really goes to the heart of the debate about how to bring relief to people here. And here's what I mean. And I want to make clear when I talk about these billionaires, I don't necessarily think of them as American. And I don't necessarily believe that they care about what flag they fly over their headquarters because they are globalists. Um, they can talk all about they want about patriotism, but it it really has no actual meaning. But let's for a moment call them U.S. billionaires. And I'm thinking of Jeff Bezos, for example. There is this crazy debate in the United States right now about whether we should spend X amount of money or Y amount of money. And you had, as you know, you've been watching this. You had the idiots who were saying, let's just give people one-time checks for $600. And when you think about that, that's kind of astonishing when you think about actually what it costs to live month to month. Then you had the more enlightened position of let's give people a $2,000 check, a one-time check, which I think also is crazy because the truth is you can't live on that for a long time, especially if you, for example, you have student debt, you're just trying to pay your rent in most urban settings. What I've argued, along with many, many other people like Pramila Jayapal, for example, in the House and Bernie Sanders in the Senate, people should get at least $2,000 every single month up to say ninety thousand dollars a year in income if your annual salary was up to ninety thousand dollars a year to get people through the pandemic and there's been this debate here crazily oh my god we shouldn't be spending all this money now actually janet yellen who as you know was just confirmed as the treasury secretary and was the former head of the federal reserve board and i can't believe that i'm about to praise someone who is the former chair of the fed she actually is saying we have to do massive spending right now my point really is that here you have all these folks who are complaining about this, but it's not really a spending problem. It's a revenue problem because we can't get these people to pay their fair share in taxes. 
So as you were saying that, I, a thought came to me, which is that the difference in the relief packages that were being debated initially, the, you know, the 900 billion that would get $600 checks out there versus what's on the table now and the 2000 checks, that amount, the difference is essentially the same order of magnitude as the profits that these 10 uh, billionaires made during the pandemic, not overall well, just their pandemic profits. So you're absolutely right on the scale. By the way, just to be right, I agree with you that they're globalists, but seven out of the 10 of them are Americans. And so the government that can best regulate their wealth power and tax them is the United States government. And so it bears a special responsibility with respect to those 10. Um, and I, I absolutely think we have to get there. But your other broader point is entirely right. We are failing to really grapple with the fact that if we want to rebuild an economy of opportunity, everything that where the money matches the dream of the United States, we cannot expect people to survive on just one off $2,000 check and then everything's fine after what has been a devastating period in their lives where they've lost jobs, they've gone back either on to unemployment, they're down to part-time work or they're in more insecure work because folks don't want to hire and they have to engage more in the informal economy. If we want to transform this economy, what we cannot get out of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris is uh, an effort to normalize this economy back to the way it was before, because that is just going to leave people falling further and further behind. There is a there's an opportunity in this moment, Jonathan, because it's never been more stark on that our economic system is broken and the kinds of answers that you're offering are actually what people need to be seriously talking about, radically changing the, the scale of investment. And that means taking it out of the top and uh, putting it where uh, all economies are driven into the hands of working people so that they can rebuild their lives. And that's a perfect lead into the wrap up question that kind of brings forward the point we were briefly talking about, about the system. You see, you and I have talked about this year after year about inequality and nothing seems to change except it gets worse. Um, although it's obviously been exacerbated now for the first time in history because of the pandemic in terms of its scale. And you mentioned before that Oxfam, this may be the position of the organization, is not opposed to folks making you know, money because of some great idea and so on. And I think fundamentally this is because we are living in this capitalist system that essentially is built to exploit people. And I, I'm not going to defend these billionaires, but this is not a bug. It's a feature. They are exploiting the way the system has been shaped. And now I'm speaking, obviously, as a Democrat socialist, as a proud democratic socialist, I don't see how you and I will ever come to a point 10 years from now if we're still talking about this. Whenever we're, we're going to say, oh, the system has realized this and woken up, I actually think the only way, partly because politicians, as we just talked about in the U.S., are not defending the people, they're doing it in a very narrow way, I see nothing less than massing in the streets, taking down the system, and having an economic revolution that changes this economic system because we can't actually reshape it without doing fundamental change. Okay, so let me debate it with you, but also agree with you. Uh, on the agreement part, let, so first let's get something off the table. Billionaires do not need to exist. We don't need people having that much wealth. We agree on that. They are a sign of a broken economic system. Right. The, 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 so let's just get that out of the way. Then the question is, is, well, OK, if billionaires and essentially folks who have more money than they know what to do with and are basically buying toys with it don't need to exist. Is there is there both political uh, opportunity and economic possibility around having a much more regulated form of what is essentially still some version of capitalism um, and I think you and I would start from the deep distrust that the capitalist economic model has a tendency to cannibalize anything that looks like regulating its power. And if you don't start from the premise 
that it won't self-regulate well, it must be curtailed, you're going to be in trouble. So I think we'd agree there. Where I, I think we can debate, and let me be optimistic about this, I think in this last election, and you, I wrote the, the power switch on this premise, that there were politicians were starting to realize that the scale of economic inequality had gotten so bad that you couldn't actually win an election in the United States anymore if you didn't promise to reverse it. So what you had was a populist authoritarian version of reversing it, appealing to the worst in our instincts to basically say, I am going to offer to tear the whole thing down. I don't need institutions. I don't need anybody but me. And I will have a direct conversation with you and tear the whole thing down. And that was Donald Trump. And he offered it to a lot of working Americans who had been feeling left behind. On the other side, you had some moderates who on their own would never have, have been able to counter the Trump vote. But what happened was people of color, progressive activists against anti-racism, against inequality, labor, women, climate activists, young people who said, this is what we're going on is rubbish. And the, you know, the Sanders and Warren people, they came together and said, look, we're not going to elect Joe Biden because we want an essentially moderate to conservative politician to restore the Obama years. We're going to elect Joe Biden because he actually has the capacity to hear where all these progressive actors are, and he will do what is politically possible to do. And my optimism is that we won't be talking about this in 10 years as not having happened, that we are going to see, not because Joe Biden is visionary, far from it, but because he now realizes what won him Georgia and what won him this election was a set of activists, many of whom come from the progressive world, that if he doesn't tackle economic inequality, he's not going to be around in four years and he's probably going to have a very bad time in two years. So we're going to need to see a greater level of ambition on the issues that you're talking about. Does that mean you're wrong that people don't need to get on the streets? No, you're absolutely right. If progressive activists don't show up every which way and say, hey, we put you into office, but now you need to deliver because we are hurting here. We're hurting in communities of color. We're hurting as unions. We're hurting in terms of, yeah, you can rejoin Paris, but we're facing climate catastrophes every year in our societies. Uh, we need you to turn rhetoric into action. If he does that, um, and he won't do it easily, um, we could be having a different conversation next year. So I so, don't know if I, we're debating or not. <laughs> I'm good. Well, yes, I'm going to agree with, again the way you did this. I'm going to agree with some of what you say, but disagree slightly um, about, if I can say, the bigger picture. You see, I think that if it was true that we wanted to confront the system, we would have elected Bernie Sanders. I think Joe Biden was lucky in that he was running against Donald Trump and the Democratic Party's mostly hit the message. I'm going to come here to what a point you made that's really important. Most of the message was screw Trump. Trump is a disaster. Get him out. The great organizing that happened, absolutely a factor. And it happened in important states. And it was in some way an anomaly because of the way we elect a president, the Electoral College, yeah. that, that great organizing happened in, in certain places. But the overall message of the party, in my view, was anti-Trump. And I think you, you saw that in how many Senate races the Democrats did not win because they weren't yeah. having an economic message to change the system. And where I do agree with you, I think the party is going to get destroyed in 2022 if there isn't kind of the sweeping change that Bernie Sanders and progressives and those people on the ground in Georgia were advocating for. I think that the uh, the last point I'll make that where I agree with you, I think one thing that happened has happened with Joe Biden, the moment has made him have to be somewhat someone slightly different than who he has been his whole entire political career. The pandemic is forcing upon him the kind of spending. And if you look at what Janet Yellen is saying, the same thing is true. They realize that just from an economic standpoint, they can't do business as usual. But I'm not convinced that that's not a slight moment of a change right now. And that once the pandemic is over, that they, hopefully not the people, they are going to snap back to where they were before. Yeah. Yeah, I think but we'll we, see. Yeah. Yeah, we will see. And uh, I hope our more optimistic uh, scenarios play out. But I think you're right. 
um, and it a lot, and I hope they understand how much is in play right now. I I wasn't thrilled uh, uh, when you look across the board at the nominations that we didn't get more you know explicitly progressive leaders on in key uh, cabinet roles, but. Uh, I do think you're right that we're seeing a different Biden now, in part because the one thing we know about him is that he does look out at, at the, the world of, of, of people who got him elected and try to understand what they want from him. He, he's probably not going to push to the left before they do, uh, but if they do push to the left, I'm hoping he can hear it. So thank you, for, as usual, for really bringing this to us, and I urge my audience to both Go to Oxfam's website, read this report, find Paul's book, his new book, um, which is really an important book to read. We talked about this on uh, my last uh, chat with Paul. You can see that in our archive. And of course, you and I, Paul, are going to continue to have this debate and have this discussion, and we'll have you back on the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jonathan. Great to talk to you as always. That'll do it for this week's broadcast. Thanks to my guest, Jeff Hauser and Paul O'Brien. Our editor, as usual, is David Hebden. Don't forget to throw us a little financial support. Go over to workinglife.org, look for the podcast tab, and click over there, and you will see a link to Patreon where you can sign up as a one-time sponsor or a monthly supporter. Or go over to Act Blue and look for Working Life with Jonathan Tassini, and there you can also become a one-time sponsor or a monthly sponsor. Hey, thanks for being with us. Look forward to having you back next week.